Apple has just launched the latest iteration of the iPhone, the iPhone 15. But what does this phone say about the state of technology today? Media tycoon Rupert Murdoch is stepping down as the chairman of Fox and News Corp. What is the legacy of this controversial figure? And finally, the 19th Asian Games has begun in Hangzhou, China. What can sports fans anticipate? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Apple fans, especially those with deep pockets, have had reason to celebrate as the latest model of the iPhone, the iPhone 15, has been launched. Now, the regular launches of various iterations of the iPhone are news not only for fans of the brand, but also for those watching the tech space because of what it says about the state of technology today. To get answers on some of these questions, we go to our resident tech expert, Bappa Sina. Bapa, thank you so much for joining us. It's not often that we do a segment which starts off with a tech review, but I think there are deeper uh, technological and political trends at play that we'll also talk about. But first, uh, since the iPhone has been launched, uh, maybe a quick, uh, let's just maybe quickly take us through what you think is significant or maybe not so significant about this launch. Right, so uh, in, for the last few years, the launch of the new iPhone is a big event, right? Because iPhone, uh, kind of represents the most premium product in the market. Apple is the uh, largest cap uh, company by market cap. So there is a lot of excitement about the launch of an iPhone. And Apple kind of launches a new iPhone around once a year or once in one and a half years. And um, so the iPhone 15 was launched this year. And um, like with every iPhone launch, there were a lot of uh, speculation, a lot of excitement on what the new iPhone will bring, what all new features it will bring. Um, unfortunately, it has turned out to be a bit of a dud, right? Uh, because uh, the, the the iPhone 15 doesn't seem to have any new uh, path-breaking features, which people have kind of come to expect of the of Apple, and uh, it's. Um, Really, in all ways, it's just incremental progress over the iPhone 14. There is no real pressing need, uh, pressing new exciting feature which will make people kind of dump their old iPhones and buy uh, the new iPhone. Um, the Really, the only significant change which uh, people are talking about is the USB-C charger. So as you know, the, the, the that Till iPhone 14 and all previous products, Apple have their own proprietary charger, right? The, the light, what's called the lightning charger. And that's not compatible with any of your other phones. Um, most of the Android phones have USB uh, chargers. Um, and, and so the chargers are interchangeable between the Android phones, but Apple kind of was the, uh, had its own uh, charging system. Uh, that changes with iPhone 15. So Apple has finally, I jumped on the USB-C uh, bandwagon. Apple is pitching it as a feature, though it, it's really not, uh, it, it's something which Apple has been forced into because the uh, EU um, mandated that all new phones uh, support uh, USB-C chargers and, and now other jurisdictions have joined into it. So Apple has kind of been dragged kicking and screaming into the USB-C bandwagon. And that's, Looks like that's about all there is to the new iPhone, um, and and so so Apple fans I think have been disappointed with, with the latest release. Right, Bapa, we often talk about phones not because they're just uh, devices you can use for a variety of purposes, but also in some senses, it seems like they do also mark one of the frontiers of where we are at with technology today in terms of uh, you know a lot of in fact what is called the tech war, a lot of the tech competition. You know, a lot of the debates around the progressive technology itself somehow seem to bring in the technology that is very essential to actually manufacturing these phones. So how do you sort of uh, say, if you were to take a survey of globally how we are at right now, how do you sort of assess the scenario? Right, uh, because the phones are uh, kind of s s more compact instruments, right, as compared to servers and um, laptops. Uh, the, in, in some sense, they are at the cutting edge of technology. Right, so, so the most compact, the most um, uh, the, the latest process uh, 
um, chips go into a phone, right? And um, so that in that way, the phones become a proxy of the of the of the limits of technological progress, right? So. Uh, and and Apple kind of has pushed that envelope, right? So Apple became kind of the, one of the first companies to embrace what is called the five nanometer uh, process technologies, and, um, and and now with the iPhone 15 and iPhone 15 Pro, uh, they are moving into like four nanometer, what they call four nanometer, and uh, the, with the, the the A16 chip in in iPhone 15 has what it's called the the four nanometer process. Uh, the 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 next chip apparently has a three nanometer process, so that's kind of the frontier of uh, of chip manufacturing, and and that's why it generates a lot of interest. Uh, however, the latest chip is not too different from the iPhone 14 chip in terms of its its performance, right? So 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 that's why it's uh, it, it's kind of seen as a, a, a marketing hype rather than like a, a advancement in technology. Now, in contrast, um, Huawei uh, kind of preempted Apple's uh, iPhone 15 launch with their launch of uh, the Huawei 60 uh, Mate uh, phone. And that kind of uh, created far more buzz in the tech sectors, at least in the tech sectors, right? And the reason for that was Huawei was um, kind of faced the brunt of US sanctions since 2019. Um, like, all the leading chip manufacturers were banned from um, selling chips to Huawei. As a result, Huawei's uh, phone business, which is a flourishing business, kind of went downhill. Um, and, uh, and 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 so it was thought that uh, with the sanctions, there were there were both sanctions on Huawei not being able to use the Android operating system as well as not being able to use the latest chips, and and that kind of. People thought that that would kill off Huawei, but with the latest announcement, Huawei seems to have overcome all these very stringent sanctions and create a really competitive phone, uh, which is which is comp which at par with the latest iPhone, right? And, and that's kind of a generating a lot of buzz in, in 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 inside China, but also in the tech community, right? Because they've kind of broken the sanctions. Now Huawei, it seems, the latest phone is a seven nanometer process. The technology and uh, it was thought that Huawei will not be able to reach seven nanometer process because the latest uh, EUV uh, lithographic machines are are banned from China. Uh, but Huawei seems to have found a way to use the old lithography machines to produce this ch chip, which is at par in performance with the Apple chips. Uh, also, um, yeah, this chip supports 5G. Uh, even though Huawei has not explicitly said that this is a 5G phone, but the tests, the the, uh, the internet speed tests which have been conducted show that they reach 5G speeds. So it looks like Huawei has been able to circumvent the US sanctions and kind of bring in all these technologies from which, which were barred to it in-house. So, so, I mean, people are saying that pretty much 90% of the components in the Huawei phone are um manufactured by local chinese companies so so that's a huge progress um about the android operating system huawei once it was banned from using the android operating system kind of created a fork of android and it's called harmony os and um the harmony os is running in this um uh, phone so uh, on and on all in all it, it's it's been viewed uh like by tech enthusiasts and by people across the globe that it's a, it's a significant tech achievement for Huawei to kind of um, produce this phone, which is at par with the best phones uh, available in spite of the crippling sanctions which US has sought to put on. Right, Papa, thank you so much for that analysis. Of course, uh, like you said, talking about phones is not just about phones, but about so many global trends. So we'll keep following that. Thank you so much. Media tycoon Rupert Murdoch has stepped down as the chairman of News Corp and Fox after decades heading these extremely controversial media houses. He's not going to go gentle into the good night, of course, as he will still be chairman emeritus. Now, the 92-year-old Murdoch did transform the media space in many countries, but not in a good way, really. It won't be wrong to say that his empire began a race to the bottom, and everyone followed, and all of us consumers and news watchers are suffering for it. To understand the legacy of Murdoch, we go to Anish. Anish, so Rupert Murdoch for the longest time has been associated with a particular kind of media culture, so to speak, a media culture which is actually, I think, percolated to every part of the world. 
no country is probably immune, even if it is not through organizations controlled by Murdoch. So, while of course he's not obviously completely going out of the picture, he's still going to be chairman emeritus and all that. But how do you sort of see the legacy of Murdoch, so to speak? Well, uh, legacy of Murdoch is, uh, it's not as complicated as many of the mainstream media would like to say. It's quite straightforward. He made tabloid the mainstream uh, a manner of uh, style in journalism, uh, especially print and TV journalism, and he pretty much vitiated a, a large part of uh, you know media culture, as you pointed out, uh, around the world. And it's, it wasn't just uh, in his home state, home country, Australia, where obviously uh, Murdoch's uh, news corp controls a big share of news, print, and television media. Uh, he also uh, affected the manner in which news uh, is produced. News is uh, uh, covered in different parts of the world, especially the United Kingdom, in US, United States, Canada, and so on, especially Anglo-Saxon world has seen that effect that the Murdoch media has had. And, it, uh, and as much as many of the other groups, uh, media houses would like to pretend otherwise, uh, it has also affected their style as well. Many of them have uh, taken to the kind of tabloid style uh, in more or less different, uh, you know, in different uh, degrees, but definitely they have taken to it. They have taken to that level of sensationalization. They have taken to that level of alarmism and obviously the kind of narratives that they set up. And uh, that is pretty much how uh, Murdoch has vitiated. Uh, and this is just without monopolies in most of these countries. Apart from Australia, he doesn't, uh, did not really have that major monopolistic uh, tendency in other places like the US or UK, but definitely it actually, uh, even at, at certain levels, they started uh, setting political uh, narratives for political parties even in different parts of the world. And that clearly shows this you know, media empire as having a significant impact uh, that we don't really see on the face value of it. Uh, but definitely there is, uh, the impact is definitely there and it's there to stay because, and the fact that, uh, as you pointed out, that he's not really going to be out of the picture. He's pretty much there as chairman emeritus, uh, a very new novel kind of uh, position. Obviously he has missed out on himself. Uh, there is definitely going to be that sort of business as usual, despite the change in uh, God in the, uh, in the mode of empire. And that, yeah, that that shows that the media houses are pretty much also benefiting from this, uh, you know, this legacy as well. And that is something that most media houses do not want to really uh, face up to uh, in most cases. Right. Also, Anish, I believe the along with tabloidization also came, you know, this whole uh, the, the question of misinformation itself, the question of fake news. Many of these trends actually have their root in that sort of tabloidization, I guess. Definitely. Uh, in many ways, this, uh, you know, this whole trend of, you know, sending out quick news, uh, you know, flashy bulletins and, you know, flashy headlines uh, created a situation where more than actually being factually correct, it's, it was more important for you to get the news out first. And that created its own set of problems because obviously truth uh, in itself does, did not really matter in most cases. In the case of Fox or say News Corp and other News Corp controlled uh, media houses, it, it they went the, went a mile ahead and said that they really don't care about the truth in most cases. And it was pretty much their political bias that they wanted to cater to. And obviously, as you pointed out, that led to a lot of uh, disinformation. And uh, or even though Fox or you know Sky uh, wasn't the first to actually begin with the disinformation campaigns in many cases, especially when you've seen uh, during the Iraq War uh, era or you know the Afghanistan War or any of the empire-led wars, where pretty much all of the mainstream media has engaged in such different kinds of uh, you know lies and disinformation, most of which they haven't owned up to. In the case of Pauls, it goes ahead and actually even uh, you know engages in disinformation at home. And we have seen that recently uh, with the U.S. Uh, presidential election in 2020, for which it had to give up, uh, you know, a significant share of, uh, you know, uh, money in settlement about, uh, I think, close to third quarters of a billion dollars uh, in settlement to, uh, you know, uh, to election, uh, to companies that actually uh, run the elections at the, uh, in the United States. 
And uh, very similarly, we are seeing right now a significant barrage of disinformation being led uh, by the Murdoch media in Australia uh, regarding the voice campaign. We've spoken about uh, the voice for the parliament and how uh, there is a massive disinformation campaign that has affected and dented its uh, credibility. But uh, we do not talk, we did not really, uh, you know, focus on how significant Murdoch media has, which actually call, started calling it uh, apartheid by a different name or, you know, uh, something that is going to augur uh, apartheid into Australia because it gives, uh, you know, uh, constitutional recognition to First, First Nation peoples. So this sort of disinformation is something that has uh, become a culture in itself for obvious Murdoch media, but that has obviously percolated into other media houses. Right. Thank you so much, Anish. Of course, uh, many of these trends are uh, structural. Many of these uh, issues are, you know, also have to do with, of course, how imperialism functions, how, uh, you know, how, this, uh, how the military industrial complex functions, etc. So many dimensions. But no way that, you know, we can ignore the fact that this ownership pattern and the kind of culture that Murdoch promoted definitely had a huge role to play in this. Thank you so much for talking to us. And finally, the 19th Asian Games, the biggest so far, began in Hangzhou, China. Thousands of athletes from 45 countries have gathered to showcase the diversity and abilities of the continent. And we even have some new events this time. Let's go to Siddhantane to find out what's special about this edition of the Asian Games. Siddhant, thanks so much for joining us. The Asian Games often does not get the attention uh, connected, uh, related to its name. After all, it's the Games of Asia, the biggest continent, so many countries participating. So tell us a bit about, you know, what it's like, the kind of uh, athletic group teams that have come in. What are the highlights? Yeah, Prashan, over 12,000 athletes uh, are in uh, Hangzhou in, in China uh, for the 19th edition of the Asian Games. Uh, the, the entire process of having an Asian Games, uh, Prashant, was started off by, you know, it was part of the, the newly independent countries of Asia kind of uh, getting together uh, to celebrate uh, the diversity as well as, as uniting uh, through sport. And uh, India, of course, hosted uh, the first of these games in 1951 in, in the capital, New Delhi. Uh, so, so it's gone a long way from then where there were just, uh, at that point, uh, 24 medal events for the men and just nine for uh, for the women. And, and all of the gold medals in the women, for example, were taken by J Japanese athletes. Uh, so, of course, sport in general, but also sport in Asia has, has, has uh, grown tremendously over that time. And uh, at this edition of the Asian Games, we have 37 sports uh, that are actually being competed in, uh, including uh, some uh, that uh, in the category of mind sports. So games like chess, uh, bridge, uh, and esports has been included uh, for the first time as a medal event uh, as well, which is a huge, uh, huge thing, both in terms of, of course, the market that the video game industry in esports presents, uh, the popularity of the sport around the world, of course. Uh, and also, uh, it's growing push uh, to become part of the Olympic program. So, so in addition to the 28 core disciplines that are part of the Olympic Games, uh, the Asian Games has uh, an, another, uh, an additional nine uh, events uh, as well. So, so it is really, really a massive 44 venues, if I'm not wrong, uh, are being used for the event. And fortunately, China uh, has the kind of infrastructure and is focusing uh, this time on the sustainability of these kind of mega events. You know, we've talked often on this show as well, Prashant, about how much uh, sort of impact on the environment, impact on, on, of course, the lives of those who live in these uh, cities where these events happen, the burden on taxpayers, uh, and all of those things that, that go into hosting this kind of a, a tournament. And, and as a lot of focus is being paid on that. Uh, if you look at the, the logo that was designed for the event, uh, it symbolizes waves uh, of water, of course, but also uh, it's meant to uh, symbolize an athletics track and uh, the signal that, you know, we are now very accustomed to the Wi-Fi signal. So radio waves in that sense. So, so and the opening ceremony, we just concluded a few minutes before we started recording, a uh, two-hour long opening ceremony was a celebration of many of those things from uh, a Chinese perspective, of course, as, as the host country. Uh, the president, uh, Xi Jinping, was was present at the opening ceremony as well. So showcasing, uh, of course, uh, the, the socialist project uh, in China and how its successes 
uh, Chinese traditions and, 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 you know, the natural diversity and beauty that exists there, but also bringing in aspects of uh, technology, artificial intelligence, uh, the fireworks, for example, that were used uh, at this event were not real fireworks, they were electronic fireworks, smokeless fireworks. Uh, so, so a lot of uh, attention is being paid, even, even the, the, the flame that symbolizes, uh, you know, the eternal flame that symbolizes the Olympic movement. Uh, even that is a zero emissions uh, flame this time around. So, so aspects of uh, real life being brought into uh, these games uh, on this uh, occasion, Prashant, to uh, to at least give people the sense that it's not something that is being that is completely disconnected uh, from reality. And of course, we've also seen some of the politics uh, playing out on the sidelines. The current tensions, for example, between. Uh, India and China. It was interesting that that the head of the Olympic Council of Asia is, is from India, Ranji Singh, a former member of the International Olympic Committee as well. And he made a speech at uh, at that opening ceremony, welcoming the athletes and, uh, and all of that. Uh, but at the same time, India's sports minister uh, not uh, going for the opening ceremony because of diplomatic tensions between the two countries. Uh, so so uh, those things will also play out. Several heads of state were present. Uh, the prime ministers of Nepal, of uh, Timor Leste, uh, and uh, and other dignitaries from around the world were there. So so it becomes also, uh, I, I suppose, a platform to engage in some of these regional conversations uh, that are so important and that we discuss so frequently on daily review. Right, Zidan, thank you so much for that. We'll keep tracking the events as it goes. And also, as you said, it's a combination of both, uh, you know, uh, both aspects reflected some of the tensions because uh, the Chinese didn't apparently grant recognition to athletes from India's state of Arunachal Pradesh, but also the fact that there are solved all these spaces of coming together as you talk about. So I guess multipolarity is also something like that, that constant push or pull. So we'll keep tracking a lot of that happening in coming weeks in the Asian Games again. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Vishal. And, and because uh, we have the Paris Olympics also, uh, in 2024, coming up very soon and, and you know, coming out of the pandemic, uh, this is also where a lot of Asian athletes will have the opportunity to qualify for uh, for, for the Olympic Games. So, so that's another aspect why uh, they assume special importance this time around. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Siddhant. And that's all we have in this episode of the Daily Debrief. We'll be back on Monday with a fresh episode of developments from around the world. Until then, keep going to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all our social media platforms and on YouTube. If you haven't hit that subscribe button already, please do.